the lake of fire. And you know, it's, it's amazing that people, you know, even in the church, they are like it's not real. And see, this, this newer breed of believers, they, they, they don't hear teachings about it, but you still, still study your own Bible. But a lot of people in the church, oh, that's hell is not literal. That's figurative. And Jesus taught more about hell than pretty much anything else. And if Jesus talked about it, and Jesus said it's real, it's real. Right? Because I think they said um, 80-something percent of people believe that God exists. They don't act like it. And I'm going to tell you why they don't act like it. 80, I think it's like 83% of people will acknowledge that there, there is a God or something. How power. 70-something percent of people believe in heaven. Between 45 and 50 percent of people believe in hell. It drops drastically when, when you say, okay, do you believe in hell? Now, they believe in heaven. They don't believe in hell. Now, the problem with this, and I'm not going to go too deep in this today, there can't be a heaven without a hell. There can't be good without bad. And so the same belief that a person say they believe in heaven, you have to believe that hell exists. Why? Because the the concept of heaven comes from the book. So you believe this part of the book, but the concept or the reality of hell also comes from the same book. So you picking and choosing what you want to believe. So realistically, it is impossible for me to believe in heaven and not believe that hell exists. See, the, the problem is because we have made God a sugar daddy, we have not taught the judgment side of God. Jesus is the grace of God revealed to men, but God, Yahweh, is still a God of justice and judgment. I can't, I, I can't stay there. Y'all trying to get me to stay there. Go to Revelation. I'm just introducing y'all. This this is my introduction, y'all. Revelation 20 and 11. Because if there is no hell, let's all go get turned up. Let's go do everything we big and bad enough to do if it ain't no hell, no consequences. What would be the purpose of Jesus dying a horrific death to redeem us from sin if he wasn't trying to keep us from something that is tormenting. That, that would be crazy for God to send his only begotten son to die for us if it ain't no consequences for our action. We can't just be shouting saints. We got to be thinking saints. You got to be cerebral and you, you got to be thinking. So why would Jesus go through all that that he went through to save us if he was not dying to save us from something? Are y'all over in Revelation 20? Drop down to verse 11. Now listen, listen carefully to this. Then I saw a great, a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Say no place. place. Verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open. Underline, underline, highlight, circle books. Y'all can tell I'm excited about this. The what were open? Books. So it doesn't tell us what the books are, but we know one book. But what are the other books? Stay with me. And the books, plural, were open, and another book, say another book. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Say in the books. Verse 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades, or hell, delivered up the dead who were in them. 
and they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, we know this other book is the book of life. It is the roll call of heaven whose name is on the roll. Now, the other people, they were not in the book. Stay with me. Remember when Jesus gave his disciples authority to go cast out devils, heal the sick, and they came back rejoicing because they say even demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, don't rejoice that demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. He was like, it's more important that your name is in the book than what you're doing. They were happy about what they were doing. He said, no, be, rejoice that your name is in the book. Because see, it didn't say that he opened up their gift manual and see what they did. He was opening up the book to see if their name was in the book. The other books, I believe, because we know that book holds the names of those that can enter into heaven. I believe that the other books are the books of the deeds that people have done. Everything that we do say is being recorded. That is not repented of. That's why he said that we'll give an account of every idle word. You're going to have to give an account of words that you use that did not have any use if you don't repent. And so I believe the books were the books of everything that those people have ever done. And I believe there is a book every time the gospel was preached and they rejected it. These are the deeds of your life, and these are the opportunities that you had to get it right, but you chose not to. So, people are going to be judged based on the books. Now, God is, he's still, you see, God is, he's awesome. He's awesome. Because he's going to give people an explanation why they inhale. I wouldn't give you no explanation. I wouldn't call you up. I wouldn't open no books. I wouldn't tell you anything. I'll just let you burn, but I'm not God. He going to call them out of the sea. He going to call them out of hell. He going to call them up, open the books, and give them an explanation why you in hell, and now you're getting ready to be cast into the lake of fire. That's the only break that they'll get is to be told why they're there and then sent to the lake of fire, which is a worse place. Say the books. So the Bible says that these people are going to be judged based on the deeds that they've done. That's why I believe that there are levels of torment because based on the deeds that they're done. I believe a pedophile would be in a deeper, more tormentous place than somebody that didn't go around raping kids and stuff. They're going to be judged based on the deeds that they've done. Now, all unconfessed sin is going to send you to hell. So it don't matter if you're in that deepest part. See, how many know if you're in jail, you in jail? It don't matter if you're in maximal or minimal. you in jail, you in jail. So if you in hell, you in hell. Ain't no good part of hell. <laughs> oh, I might can make it, baby. No, believe me, you can't. Why? You can't because it was not created for you. So, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I hope y'all taking good notes. There, there are three thoughts when it comes to death or the afterlife. The, the first one, um, Brother Carlton Pearson didn't invent it. He just brought back an old doctrine. It's called unif- universalism. Universalism It's the belief that every person is already saved. They just don't know that they're saved. Well, let me just read this definition. Uh, Universalism, reconciliation, also called universal salvation. Um, Christian universalism 
or in context simply universalism, it's a doctrine, excuse me, that all sinful and alienated human souls, because of the divine love and mercy of God, will ultimately be reconciled to God. When they were interviewing Carlton Pearson, when he first got off and started talking about this universalism, they were like, so the Buddhists, the Muslim, the rapists, he said, oh, they're all going to heaven. He said, he, they, he, they say, well, how can it? He said, oh, everybody say, they just don't know it. And God is not going to hold it against them because they don't know their say. So he said, do you think God will let more people go to hell than heaven? That's what he said. Jesus said it would happen like that, right? So universalism is the belief that everybody going to heaven. Here again, why would God kill Jesus if everybody going to heaven? Why would Jesus say, I am the way, the truth and the life? Nobody gets to the Father but by or through me. I'm the door. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. I mean, so that in and of itself debunks universalism. Now, the second belief, Sister Teresa, is annihilationism. That, like to annihilate, annihilation, annihilationism is the belief that once a person die, their soul just burns up. The wicked just burn up, and then the righteous go to heaven. So they believe with the, with the theory of annihilation that all wicked people at death, they just almost like spontaneous combustion. They just burn up and that's it. But the, the righteous people go to heaven. That's not biblical. We just read starting off that the wicked and the nation that forget God will be turned into hell. It didn't say they're going to burn up. They're going to be turned into hell. They're going to burn in hell. That's the word, right? So we got universalism, annihilationism, then we have purgatorism, which was started by the Catholic Church. <laughs> if you're an ex-Catholic, I'm not trying to. It was actually um, this doctrine or belief started in 1274 at the Second Council of Lyon. The, the, the Catholics came up with this. Purgatory is the belief that only confessed sins are forgiven, and if you die with any unconfessed sin, you go to purgatory, and you just keep burning until you burn all them sins off. And eventually, you're going to get to heaven. Y'all not talking. So you can be in purgatory for decades, for centuries. <laughs> you don't, nobody knows because however long it takes for those unconfessed sins to burn off of you, that's how long you're going to be in purgatory. So if you didn't get it right here in the earth, minister, right, you can get it burned off of you in purgatory. That's what our Catholic brothers and sisters believe. All right? So that's, that purgatory is strictly Catholic. That's not church doctrine. That's Catholic doctrine. The Catholic got their own Bible, y'all. They took the, the 66 canonized books of the Bible and then they added the other books, like the Maccabean books, the book of Ezra. They added books that were not supposed to be canonized, so they're in their Bible. Yeah. And so they, they come up with this weird doctrine of stuff based on what they say it should be. It's not what the original apostles and what Jesus put is what they think it should be. And Jesus didn't say you can go to purgatory. He never mentioned purgatory. So it's what they came up with at this council meeting of popes and bishops from the Catholic Church. Purgatory. So all of these are wrong. Universalism is wrong. Have you noticed that the grace gospel sound a lot like universalism? Like basically everybody's saved and you can do what you want to do. And we, we're noticing that even a lot of what we call evangelical or word of faith people have gotten off into this super hyper grace and they're teaching the gospel wrong. And instead of people having a sense of holiness and awe for God, they have this loose lifestyle because you told them that they're forgiven and they can do what they want to do. They ain't even got to confess their sin. So it's creating a church of sinners. 
And sinners not going to complain when you give them permission to sin. They're going to flock to it. I don't want to flock to a preacher telling me truth and that hell exists. I want to go where they can tell I can keep staying in my sin. So that's what blows up to become mega messes. There's no help up in here. <laughs> so let's get into my message. All that was introduction. I want to start out for the time that I have left talking about the nature of God. The nature of God. What is nature? It is inherent character or a basic constitution. So when we talk about the nature of God, we're talking about the character of God. Now, one of the things you got to understand about God, God is immutable. He never changes. Thank you. That's my Bible college student right there. He never changes. Now, when you say God is immutable, he never changes. He's like, well, he changed. He repented. He changed. We ain't talking about his mind. When we're talking about that God is immutable, he is not capable or susceptible to change. Meaning God does not change in his character, his attributes, or his nature. He does change his mind at times, but he never changes who he is. So if we're going to talk about the nature of God, we have to know who he is and that God does not change. Because a person changes their mind does not mean they change their character. I can be getting ready to write you off and give you the left hand of fellowship. But the Lord can say, don't do it, give them grace because I'm about to do something. So I changed my mind. That didn't change who I am. That changed what I was going to do. And so when we talk about the immutability of God, we're talking about God does not change who he is. How many know he doesn't change? Go over to Malachi chapter 3. It's more over there than your tithe. We just, that's all people know in Malachi. Child, to bring the whole tithe. No, it's more. It's actually Malachi actually is a powerful book. Talks about marriage. Talks about when you got married, how God was at the altar when you made your vow. It's a, you need to read the whole book. <laughs> but we are going to chapter three. Malachi chapter three, verse six. Listen to what God says. God says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. Oh, sons of Jacob. So God says he does not change. He doesn't change. See, that's how you know we're in error when we got a church today that's unchanged everything. And we're trying to tell people God didn't really mean it. Let me take, excuse me, let me tell you what he really meant. Y'all ain't never heard that. You, you got preachers on TV trying to re-explain the Bible. God didn't really mean that. Let me tell you what he really meant. And the scholars got it wrong. I'm going to stick with the all-knowing, all-wise God. I'm not going to stick with some tricky wiki that's done been to theological school and learned enough just to mess them up. I'm going to stick with the Bible. You're going to tell me, that God didn't mean this when I studied this out in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic, and this is what God meant. Oh, no, because, see, the, the word is evolving. And so as we evolve, the word takes on different meanings. No. See, if you haven't heard these arguments, you better get used to them because that's what fools are saying. Like, if, if Jesus was here today, he wouldn't condemn homosexuality. He would embrace the LBGT community. Yeah, he would embrace them in love, but he'll still tell them, repent. He would love them as they are, but he wouldn't let them stay like they are. We love everybody. But because I love you don't mean I'm going to get in trouble with God. I'm not going to twist the word because I love you. God knew what he said then and he know what he expects now. So he said that he don't change. He does not change. Say he does not change. Go to Hebrews chapter 13 verse number 8. Hebrews 13 and 8. The writer of Hebrews says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, 
and forevermore. I'm going to throw nine in for free. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with fools which have no profit, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So you got to know the truth. He said, don't get caught up in these strange teachings. God is changing himself. You're lying. You're lying. Stop lying on God. He says that he's the same yesterday. Listen, this is powerful. If I could go back in time to yesterday, God was God then. Then come back to the day, he's the same way. And then go into eternity, he's the same way. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He does not change. Now, people can try to worship a God of their understanding, but that does not mean it's the God of the Bible. Why is this important? Because we're talking about hell. And in order to understand hell, you got to know the nature of God. See, I can't get into hell till I show you who God is. Then you understand how a loving God could create a place of torment and allow people to go. Not send them, allow them. Nobody come in here and just arrest you and take you to jail unless you broke the law. You don't go to hell unless you broke the law. So we saw out of the mouth of two or three witnesses that he does not change. We saw he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Let's get one more witness on this. Go over to Numbers 23 and 19. Numbers 23 and 19. When you get there, say, I'm there. Two people there. (laughs) All right. I'm just going to read. You just write it down. Verse 19. God is not a man. Let's just stop right there. God is not a what? Stop treating him like he's a man. God is not a man. Everybody always hurt me and God might hurt me. God is not a man or a woman for those that say he's a woman. God is not a man that he should lie. I don't care who lied to you. God don't lie. He doesn't lie. He is not a man that he should lie. He wouldn't gain anything from lying. God can't lie though. He can't. If he tried to lie to Noah, he couldn't. If God said it's a purple cow out there, by the time you go to that door, it's purple. It's going to be what he called it. He can't lie. That's why when God say you the head and not the tail, he can't lie. See, your mind try to fight it, but when God say something, he can't lie. When he say you above and not beneath, he can't lie. When he say you're the healed of the Lord, he can't lie. So the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do or has he spoken and will he not make it good? So if God said there was a hell yesterday, there's a hell today and there will be a hell forevermore. God, he can't lie. So the nature of God is that God can't change. God is the same yesterday to and forevermore, and God will not lie. So that shows us God's nature and his character. So a God that has those attributes, you know he's not just doing crazy stuff. We are like God out here just winging it. He, he, he's... He's the same. Thank you for watching Transforming Lives. We hope that this message has been a blessing to you. Our mission is to raise up a body of believers that demonstrates the power of the word in every arena of life. Sowing a seed to our ministry will help to fulfill our mission. There are multiple ways to give to WLCI. You may text to WLCIG to 54244 or give through our website at www.wordlifecenter.org. Or you may also send a seed offering to 
Post Office Box 293, Kannapolis, North Carolina 28082. The Word of God says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Thank you in advance for supporting Word Life Center International. I've given you today. God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. Meaning that God knows everything. God is everywhere at the same time. He's omnipresent, right? He is all powerful. He's omnipotent. Meaning that if God is omniscient, if he knows everything, he knows everything we do. Who, who else could make a judgment that would be totally accurate other than somebody that knows everything? His judgments can't be unjust and unfair because he know everything. I didn't see it, but he know. He knows it all. So how can he be partial in his judgment if he knows it all? He couldn't be just if he didn't know it all. You see, you can't be just if you don't have all the facts. From the author of Occupy comes the new bestseller, Capacity. The ability to hold and handle what has been given. Order your copy of Apostle Jeff Sanders' newest book, Capacity, now available at Amazon.com. Capacity is available on paperback and also on Kindle. Let's stay connected. We have multiple ways for you to connect with us. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For more information about our ministry, visit us online at wordlifecenter.org or call us at 704-298-0845. We here at WLCI would love for you to come visit us where our pastors, Jeff and Michelle Sanders, teach the uncompromised Word of God. Their mission is to raise up a body of believers that demonstrate the power of the Word in every arena of life. Come visit us at 1124 Rosewood Avenue in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Thank you for joining us today in Transforming Lives. We pray that the message has blessed you and that it has pulled you closer to God and His Word. Until next time, remember to be transformed by the renewing of your mind.